Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Maria Quinones Sanchez. I'm councilwoman in the 7th Councilmatic District. I want to thank PAL and its leadership for allowing us to come here this afternoon. I'm going to apologize for the heat. Um, didn't know, know it was going to be the beginning of the heat wave, but I appreciate everyone for coming this afternoon or this evening, early evening. Because of the time sensitivity, as you know, we move the time from 6 to 5.30 because we wanted to... I'm going to ask the clerk to read the bill and then turn it over to the chairwoman of Public Health and Human Services, Councilwoman Bass, who joins me this evening along with Councilwoman Helen Gim to her right. So will the clerk read the title of the resolution. Resolution 180037, a resolution authorizing the Committee on Public Health and Human Services to hold hearings to assess the City of Philadelphia's efforts as coordinated by the Managing Director's Office and our Human Services Department to prevent and treat abuse, addiction, and disease related to the use of opioids. Thank you. Um, I want to recognize that many of the di different departments are here, the administration, and we will hear from them after the district attorney, and then we will go on to our community panel. If you have not signed up to register, you must do so, do so at the front. Um, for time sensitivity, we are asking that people who are testifying be residents of the impact and neighborhood. I want to recognize Councilman Mark Squilla, who joins me to my left, and then joining him, Councilman Alan Dom, to my left. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our chairperson. I don't know if Councilman Squilla, you have anything to say real quickly? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for this very important meeting. Um, I want to, number one, thank everyone for being here. I want to thank uh, my colleagues for being here as well. And I know that we are short on time, so I'm going to be short on comments as well. So if we could uh, begin and have comments from our district attorney, Mr. Krasner, uh, because I know that he is uh, on a very short schedule today. So, uh, Mr. Krasner. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, council members, for giving me the opportunity to come here and to address the incredibly important issues of what's happening in Harrogate. We prepared some data for today, and we have provided that to the members of the public who are here and also to the council members because we think it's really important not to talk about stories but to talk about truths and talk about what is really going on. Given the period of time, the amount of time that we have and the fact that everyone can study these numbers later, there's a couple of very, very important messages that I think come out of this data and I'd like to go over it with you. First of all, this data gives you the opportunity to review to what extent certain crime is actually going up or remaining fairly constant, to what extent it is much higher, not much higher, whatever that may be. And the data speaks for itself. But the second and most important point is this. For those of you who are under the impression that the district attorney's office is not bringing cases when the police make arrests, well, that is nonsense. And whoever has told you that is misleading you. The data is here and it is quite clear. If you look at page three and you look at the arrests that occurred in 2018, which are reflected here for specific offenses, and then you look down at the bottom of the page and you look at the cases that are opened for those same specific offenses, what you're gonna see is this. Aggravated assault, firearm arrests. 46. Cases opened, 43. Aggravated assault, no firearm, 110. Arrests. Cases opened, 115. Homicide, five arrests. Cases opened, five. Rape, arrests, nine. Cases opened, nine. Robbery by... Now, in some of these instances, you're seeing a slightly different number. That is because the number of cases opened may reflect the number of victims. So if you have an assault of two people, then that may count as two cases, even though it was a single arrest, all right? But what you're seeing over and over and over and over is that virtually every single arrest that is submitted to the district attorney's office is being charged as a criminal offense. I understand there's some people who don't want to tell that story, that they would prefer to tell a story 
about how the district attorney's office is turning away arrests. But that is not what the data says because that is not true, with a couple of exceptions. Number one, we said that we would not arrest and prosecute people for possession, I said possession, of marijuana. And we don't. What we are doing is consistent with what the mayor did some years ago. And what he did some years ago is he created a ticket, a civil ticket, for possession of marijuana. But for whatever reason, when I came into office, the office was still prosecuting a small number of those people. We're not going to do that. We need to spend our time solving homicides, not arresting kids for possession of marijuana when it's becoming legal all over the country. And then the other thing that we stopped doing is we stopped prosecuting sex workers, meaning if they did not have a long record for it, we stopped giving them a criminal, criminal record for it, and we did it because we believe that they are victims. We believe that they are victims of trauma, often sexual trauma. We believe in many instances they're suffering from addiction disorder, and there are better ways to help victims than to criminalize them put them in jail cells, give them criminal records so it becomes harder for them to recover. Are we prosecuting Johns? In other words, are we prosecuting the people who pay them for sex? The answer is yes. Are we prosecuting the people they work for? In other words, they're pimps. The answer is yes. That has always been the answer. So if you find yourself in a situation where you are being told by law enforcement that this DA's office will not prosecute a drug dealer, you're being lied to. We prosecute drug dealing of all types, including drug dealing in marijuana. Those are the facts, and the statistics are here. If you're being told by people in law enforcement that we will not prosecute people who break into your cars, you're being lied to. We do it all the time, and the data is here. There are occasions, and this has happened, for example, in San Francisco, when law enforcement may, may not want to do something. They may decide that they got better things to do so they don't want to do something. The battery got stolen from your car, they don't want to do it. Let me tell you what else they don't want to do. They don't want to tell you they don't want to do it. A lot easier to say, oh, I can't do that. District attorney will never prosecute it. Do you understand what I'm saying here? This office is all about prosecuting drug dealing, violent offenses, we are all about prosecuting quality of life offenses in most of these categories. And there should be no misunderstanding bet between you as members of the public and me. That is the bottom line. Now, part of our philosophy, and we're very serious about this, is that it is more important for us to focus on the most violent and most serious crimes. And we are, in fact, in the middle of an opioid crisis what we know about opioids from the Center for Disease Control is that people can store, start to become addicted on the second day of a prescription to pills, day two. And for people who receive a prescription for 10 days to opioid pills, according to the Center for Disease Control, 20% will become addicted in 10 days to opioids. So let me ask you a question. Why the hell do we have so many pills being prescribed by medical doctors? The United States is gobbling up about 75% of the prescription opioid pills in the world. They don't do this in countries all over the world because countries all over the world don't tolerate it. And what makes it even worse is that 10 years ago, the supply of pills that was allowed by the federal government was one-fourth of the supply of pills we have now. So why do you think there has been a 400% increase in the available pills in the United States? Money. Big farmer got big money. And he big money for big politicians. People like Donald Trump like him because he's a businessman too. And he's frankly okay with this country being flooded with those pills with that level of addiction. Once people become addicted, you know what happens. They go back to the doctor looking for more pills. The doctor gets nervous, says, I can't give you any more pills. And then they go to the street and they buy heroin and they buy fentanyl and they die at a rate of about three or four people every day in Philadelphia. It is what? The third worst county in the United States. And the only reason the overdoses are coming down at all is because the city has had the wisdom and the police department has had the wisdom to put naloxone out there. 
So we're able to save, who knows, but more people because of naloxone. This is the real situation. The real situation is that when you addict half a country by letting the medical profession run amok and letting Big Pharma run amok, you got a problem. And if you want big solutions, that means federal government should clamp down on that supply of pills from the 400% it is now back to the 100%, or maybe clamp down even more. Bear in mind that there are hospitals in Philadelphia now that have the wisdom that they won't even give you opioids if you come in with a broken leg. Jefferson Hospital, you come in with a broken leg, you're leaving with no opioids because they'd rather see you in pain than see you dead. And they are absolutely right about that. I know a young woman in the court system who had bariatric surgery. She was having weight issues. She's about 30 years of age. By one year after her bariatric surgery, she was dead. And she was dead because they thought it was a good idea for someone leaving the hospital after bariatric surgery who had already had some issues with consumption. They thought it would be a great idea to give her opioids. This is completely unacceptable. And we can all pretend that somehow, even though the war on drugs was a complete failure, we're going to arrest our way out of it this time. Somehow, even though prohibition of alcohol didn't even work in the United States, we're just going to prohibit it, and it's all going to work this time. But here's the news. That is not fair to these police officers, because they are not miracle workers. They cannot change human nature. They cannot change the fact that there's four times as many pills as they should be out there. The big solutions are going to have to come at that level. I guess the question then becomes, what can we do under these circumstances? And the simple answer is we can work together any way possible. I had the pleasure of being in a meeting with a couple of these council people yesterday uh, with some people from the American Civil Liberties Union to try to find a pathway where the city could do some things without facing a lawsuit. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but I was happy to assist in arranging it, and I hope it will because I know that your lives up here are incredibly difficult when you have people who, because they are suffering from a disorder called addiction, are homeless, and they are defecating outside, and they're leaving dirty needles, and they're shooting up in public, and your kids see it, and your kids have to step over dirty needles. I know how incredibly difficult that must be. This is not the only place that ever happened. There's no easy solution to it, but we're not gonna get anywhere unless we can look at it through a health lens and realize that substance abuse addiction disorder is a disorder. It is a disease. And if we can get public health together with the city, together with law enforcement, we may be able to make some progress. I am open to all good ideas on this topic and working with people, but I'm not open to stupid. I'm not open to doing stuff that has never worked and will never work because that doesn't help anybody. The truth is that our crisis with shootings and with homicides is directly related to our crisis with opioids. Let us remember, we actually right now have 3%, this is according to the Philadelphia police, violence is down 3% in the last 18 months, which is how long I've been in there. It is down 3%. And those statistics include all kinds of violent offenses, among them homicide and uh, shootings, but that ain't good enough because the homicides are up, the shootings are up, and that carnage is unacceptable. We also right now, if we look at the police statistics, have seen that crime overall is down 1%. 1%, all right? Don't write anybody. Don't tell them a miracle has happened. It's only 1%. And the truth is, that's not really what most of us are so worried about. We are more worried about the reality that we have too many shootings and we have too many homicides. And that's the work that we need to do. We need to try to get at that. But this DA's office is open to all intelligent, science-based approaches to getting this done. And that is why we brought you this data. And that's why we gave it to the public. And that's why I rely so heavily on people like Wes and Dakota, who's running around here, looking handsome, there he is, to spend all this time digging in on this data. We cannot have conversations without the truth, because it's easy to say, oh my God, a terrible crime happened. Well, yes, it did. But it, does that reflect what's going on overall? Or something bad happened to me. A police officer told me that they can't arrest people who steal his, my car battery because the DA won't prosecute it. Well, that's nonsense. In fact, that's a damn lie. So we're going to have to work with what is 
true, and we're going to have to work with what is science so that we can try to get somewhere. But hopefully, if we work together, we can all do that. Thank you, Mr. District Attorney, for your comments. Um, I want to open it up so that our panel can uh, ask some questions. I do want to uh, make one remark, though, which is that we as public servants, um, you know, people rely on us. We are all sort of like the last line of def defense. And so it really behooves each and every one of us to work together. We had a conversation earlier today about uh, the importance, why well, I made it a point to talk about the importance that the district attorney's office, the police department, all of our law enforcement officials really do make every attempt to try to work together. And so I would just suggest that as we make comments to suggest that someone is, you know, outright lying because there is a difference of opinion, that that's something that we probably want to uh, phrase maybe in a different way. I think that, again, if we have some, some difficulties with one another, that we have to step back and have those conversations off to the side and, um, and deal with them and find ways that we can all work together. But uh, we certainly don't want to give the impression to the public that we're not all working together and trying to address some of the things that are happening in these neighborhoods that have people basically terrified. And so when we live in these neighborhoods and you hear gunshots and you know what's happening, I think that that's something that we really have to be much more mindful of. So with that being said, anybody uh, have a comment? Councilwoman Sanchez? I want to thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I know your time. This is the continuation of a conversation that started many, many months ago, and this is by no far, by no means the end of it. I guess the challenge for folks, and I, you know, and you walk the area, we've, we've seen the area, the recognition that we have folks in addiction who are living homeless in the street, and the fact that every day, in order for them to feed their addiction, they are uh, consuming drugs four and five times a day. Well, four and five times a day, they're victimizing someone to get the money to buy the drugs. So to Councilman Bass's point, not disputing the data, but when you are a resident who can't have a flower pot, who can't have a barbecue, who can't have a chair, how do we reassure them that the public safety strategy, and again, we're not gonna arrest our way out of it, but how do we make people feel comfortable when they are victims and many times they will unreport? No one's gonna call the police to say they stole their chairs. How do we make them feel more comfortable that we are working together to improve and restore their quality of life? Well, I think one thing we do is we present real data. And if that, what that real data shows is that when there are arrests made, there are cases prosecuted, then that should be reassuring. Because it means that whatever they may have heard is not correct. And what's correct is what the data indicates. So I think we have to take a very science-based approach. We have to answer these real, serious concerns, these fears, these difficulties. And I, trust me, I know how difficult they are. I spent 30 years of a criminal justice career up in this area all the time. This is bad. This is worse than I ever remember it during those years when I was up here, you know, representing clients or whatever it may be. This is rough. We have to let them know that we are willing to come here. We're willing to talk here. We're willing to share data. We're willing to meet. And I am willing to meet at any time. People don't know this, but I, you know, not only do I talk to the police commissioner probably two or three times a week by telephone about various issues and text them, but he and I were just in Washington, D.C., meeting with chiefs of police and chief prosecutors from all over the country to talk about the kinds of issues we're having. And this is not the only place where there is an opioid crisis, although it is truly a major crisis in Philadelphia. So they need to know that we are willing to look at the science and look at creative solutions, intelligent solutions that are not only going to be directed at getting at the problem in ways that are effective, but that also show a concern for the community itself um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, my door is wide open. You know, I will be delighted to work with uh, any anti-violence plan. I'm more than happy to meet with these and other council people to work on solutions. I think the Department of Health has to be involved. And we have kicked around some ideas. I think there are some ideas for how to do this in ways that make more sense than locking everybody up, which we all know doesn't work, 
um, but also our response do involve our trying to engage people and getting them back with their family, getting them into treatment, getting them into the kind of a situation where they can think for themselves as opposed to being so intoxicated on drugs that they really are not even in a position to make intelligent decisions anymore. Thank, thank you, Larry. Um, and thank you again for meeting with the ACLU and us and, and trying to come up with other ideas to try to address this issue. But what, what's your opinion on the broken window theory about quality of life issues and, and crimes that are the smaller crimes? And then when they sort of get ignored, it leads to bigger crimes. So, I mean, broken windows can mean a lot of things. It can mean a widely discredited theory that was used, for example, in Ferguson, Missouri, which amounted to let us, I mean, I'll just be blunt, let's basically take every poor resident, most of them black residents, and let's write them up a ticket because their grass is a little bit long, or let's give them a big fat ticket because they've got a broken taillight, or let's go on about how there's actually a broken window. And what we'll do then is we'll take a bunch of people who don't have a lot of money, we'll make them go to court all the time, we'll make them pay a whole bunch of fines, and better yet, we will use that to fund our revenues. That was a disaster. Everything that we saw in Ferguson with the rioting and, and so on was a direct result of government preying on poor people. One of the words that was used about it was kleptocracy. In other words, they ran a third of Ferguson's budget off the backs of poor people by writing them up for little stuff in a way that we never write up wealthy people and never would write up people in Chestnut Hill. So I think if that's the, the kind of broken windows we're talking about, that is a failure. If we look at what happened in New York, where you know the tools that they were always bragging about were illegal stop and frisk, and then what they called a broken windows theory, where you would clamp down as hard as possible on, on small offenses, and they claimed that this was a huge victory for New York. What they didn't mention is that this was not done in other cities like Chicago, where crime also came down. And the other thing they did not mention is that when they stopped doing things like broken windows and illegal stop and frisk, crime still went down. Well, there are reasons why it went down, and just one of those reasons, which none of the New Yorkers really want to talk about because they like to take credit, is that the average house price in Manhattan is $1.2 million. $1.2 million. The average house price in Philly is about $140,000. So if you basically price poor people completely out of an area you may have plenty of crime. They might be ripping us all off on Wall Street and causing the, the mortgage collapse. But hedge fund managers are usually not fighting over drug corners, okay? That is gentrification. That is not actually a solid plan for reducing crime. So that is, I mean, I think that is a fair version of how I use the term broken windows. Having said that, there are quality of life crimes that need to be enforced in the sense that we need to make sure that there are certain things that are happening in the neighborhood that do not make it difficult to live there or to want to be there. And that's where the line is. Because we could also spend all of our time on quality of life crimes and be where we stand now, which is that our clearance rate for homicides is not as high as we would like. And I have to tell you, I know that the department has tried very hard and the clearance rate is coming up, and I applaud them for that. But most of us would like to see more than, a, you know, maybe 40% last year, 50% this year, clearance rate for homicides. I can't prosecute those homicides if I never get them. And as all of you know, if there's one shooting and you don't nip it in the bud, you don't get a hold of the people involved quickly, you're liable to have retaliatory shootings back and forth. So it's really important to get to those cases early. And once again, I applaud everything that is being done in the department to clear shooting cases, but the clearance rate for shooting cases is lower. It's more on the order of 30%, depending upon what year you're looking at and so on. So we have to prioritize. And if we're really going to try to get our arms around violent crime, we're not going to do it by bringing back Ferguson and by, you know, penalizing people for minor offenses that they really can't afford to deal with. It. Okay, so if we're not talking about minor offenses and, you, and there are some quality of life concerns that you think should be enforced, what are they? Well, I mean, I, there's about 200 different things we could talk about. Is there a particular area? Well, give, give me five. Okay. Um, well, first of all, any type of drug dealing activity, it's quality like that. That, should, that should lead to arrests. Why would we not arrest them? I bring charges in every one of those cases. Uh, you know, we take that stuff very seriously. There are, there are all kinds of progressive places and countries around the world, but they all prosecute drug dealing. That's what you do with drug dealing. 
Another one would be when you have people who are trafficking women or they're trafficking labor. So you basically have people who are not the victims of this, but you have people who are profiting from it. We go after those people vigorously. We wish we could catch more of them. You know, I consider that to be a pretty terrible thing to do. When you have people who are, uh, you know, going up and down the street and they're opening all the car doors and they're going through your change, give me those cases. I know they're hard to catch. I know that. I think that often what we have with those situations is the police are just not in a position to have the perpetrator. They haven't actually observed it. But when we get it, we bring it. I know that's incredibly annoying to have people in your cars and messing up your cars and that sort of thing. Car theft, just one more example. That car's a big deal to you. That car may be the only way that you get your kids where they got to go and you get to work. We prosecute those cases. You know, I understand that these are not Net, this, these are not homicides, these are not shootings, but they do affect your quality of life. My home was burglarized twice. I lived up in the Northwest for 26 years. It was burglarized twice. That is really an obnoxious crime. It affects the quality of life. Even though none of us were home, even though no one was hurt, it's rough. That is the kind of stuff we prosecute. We prosecute vigorously, and honestly, I could go on and on, but I consider those to be no, that, real that, priorities. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any additional questions? Comments? Okay, Councilman Dom. It's just an idea I wanted to just ask you. I'm not sure, but from Kensington and Allegheny down to Kensington and Lehigh, is that area under camera? I don't know offhand. I think probably some of our police colleagues could answer that better for you. And in your opinion, would cameras be a possible help if we could pay for the monitoring of them once we put them in? All right, so I, as a prosecutor, I love cameras. I love cameras. About half of our homicides anymore actually involve video. That absolutely was not the case 15 years ago. They greatly increase your chance of getting a conviction. They greatly decrease the chance of having an innocent person identified. They show us the sequence of events, exactly how it happened. You can tell a lot about criminal intent from cameras. So I am a huge fan of cameras. I just wish, you know, I just wish they were all HD. I wish they would capture everything like it had been, been made in Hollywood, and sometimes they don't. But even the ones that just show you silhouettes are so important. And I, I just think that investment in cameras can be an incredibly important thing to do. So well, I guess what I'm getting at is that it's your opinion that we should invest in high quality cameras in these areas to one, be able to catch what's going on, two, maybe prevent what's going on if people are even aware of it? The answer is yes. SEPTA has a uh, marvelous system of video. Needless to say, it's indoors, but we have been able to solve crimes off of SEPTA video. We've been able to see the video of the person who might be the perpetrator who came into the subway station, put his palm down on the bench, and then we could go and take the palm print off the bench and put together whole cases. I mean, it's incredibly important stuff, and, and to the extent we have more of it, it can only help. I realize we can't spend all of our money on cameras, nor should we, but I do think that they're a pretty important way of solving crimes, and they're also a really good deterrent to having bad activity in certain lo locations, especially once you clean out a corner, putting a camera there can make a huge difference. I know that today we had a meeting on uh, safety and gun violence. Those hot spots we talked about, would better cameras in those areas be a big help? I would say yes. I, I do want to defer, though, to my police colleagues here because I know it's not that simple. Sometimes you put up a camera and it's taken down in a day, you know? Or sometimes there are situations in which it's not exactly what law enforcement is looking for. So I, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but I can tell you from my perspective, good video tells the truth. And there ain't nothing better than the truth when you're, when you're doing law enforcement. Okay, thank you very right. much. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Okay, unless there are any additional questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Krasner, for attending and uh, for your comments this evening. We really appreciate you and, and look forward to working together to address all of these issues that we have in our city. Thank so you, Council thank you so much. I appreciate Absolutely. Your Can we have the clerk call the next panel? Okay. Uh, from the administration, we'll have Mr. Brian Abernathy, our city's managing director, Mr. Tumar Alexander, the managing director's office.
Hold on. Hold on, Marnie. Hold on. Did he leave yet? Is he still here? Is he going? Hold on. We have his chief of staff, Arun. Are you avail Are you available to speak on his behalf or see if he is able to come back and take questions on behalf of the community? Thank you so much. If you could check and ask him to come back in so that we can have uh, the community ask questions. Thank, thank you. No, I, I appreciate that, and I think that that's very important, obviously. People want to hear and have their questions answered directly, um, so that's very important. So hopefully we'll be able to get him to come back in here. So thank you. Thank you, Marnie. Um, okay, so we have Mr. Brian Abernathy from the Managing Director's Office. We have two more. Alexander, we're going to get started, and hopefully he'll be able to come back in for a few minutes. But uh, why don't we start with you two gentlemen, and then we'll bring in the rest of the panel. Great. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, my name is Brian Abernathy. I'm the city's ma I'm the city's managing director. I'm joined with Tumar Alexander, my first deputy. Uh, First, I want to thank you for having this conversation in, our, in this community. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tumar uh, to walk through the progress that we've made in resilience um, shortly, but I wanted to, to lay a, a short context around what the resilience project is and why we structured it the way that we did. Deal with these issues and their quality of life on a day in and day out basis. When we set up the resilience project, it was really geared to try to tackle both issues at the same time. Um, we recognize that we're not going to be able to resolve the opioid crisis. We're not going to be able to tackle the challenges of Kensington, Harrogate, and Fairhill without tackling both issues simultaneously. Uh, we pulled together 35 different city agencies to meet on a regular basis. Uh, multiple departments bringing different perspectives and trying new things. The intent was to make sure that we broke down barriers, we broke down silos, that we heard different perspectives, um, and that we weren't afraid to fail, that we were willing to try things that we wouldn't normally try, that we wouldn't allow bureaucracy to get in our way. We've made a lot of progress in the last eight months, a lot of progress that Tumar is going to go through, um, but we also recognize that we have a lot more to do. Um, our kids are still seeing people shoot up in the middle of the street. People are still walking over, people who have nodded out on the sidewalk. There's still open prostitution, open drug use, uh, violence, and a host of quality of life issues, um, which is why the mayor has extended the order and why we're continuing to do our work on a daily basis. Um, we own those issues. We recognize that we're not perfect. We recognize that we've made mistakes. We expect the community to hold us accountable to those mistakes. We expect you to make sure that our feet are to the fire, to make sure that we continue to do better. We're committed to doing that. We're not leaving this effort. We are not leaving Kensington, Harrogate, Fairhill, or any of the other surrounding communities to deal with this on their own. We've done that for too long as a city. Um, we are here. We are here to stay until we actually find a path forward to solve some of these issues. Thank you. Before Tumar starts, I want to just remind folks that when you walked in at the table, we have the booklet that was submitted to us by the administration, the Resilience Project at Work, and there was also a slide presentation at the desk. So um, this is the material that both uh, the managing director and the deputy managing director will be alluding to. They're all uh, available at the table. In both English and Spanish, Councilman. And they're bilingual. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Tumor Alexander, first deputy managing director. If you, if you can, I just want you all to allow me to walk through a small, a small slide that talks about the key accomplishments we've made in a project resilience, in a resilience project over the course of the last eight months, along with echoing my colleague Brian Abernathy and acknowledging that we have a lot of work left to do. Uh, when this project first started, we were tasked with creating seven mission areas. Mission area one, to clean up major encampments. Uh, key accomplishment from that mission area is we cleared all major encampments. What's next, the work, work left to do is transitioning 
this mission area to create and implement a community and economic development strategy that focus on vacant land and vacant buildings within the Kensington Harrogate uh, East Division community, finalize a policy with the manager director's office to prevent and address future encampments from popping up citywide, not only in Kensington. Mission area two, reduce criminal activity. So far, we've expanded police assisted diversion program to the East Division. We've, st we've stood up at least two shifts of, of workers for this program and are looking to actually do treat three shifts where we have 24-hour coverage. We've launched safe, co safe corridors programs at six schools and looking to do them in others. We've installed over, with the work of the streets department, we've installed over a thousand LED street lights and additional cameras under the Frankfurt, under the Frankfurt L line. We've launched the warrant initiative resulting in 180 arrests and getting $262,000 worth of narcotics to 20 guns off of the street. Work left to do is recruit, recruit more volunteers and expand the Safe Corridor program to more schools. Continue interagency work focused on identifying and taking down violent mid to high level drug trafficking organizations. Coordinate with the implementation of the Philadelphia Roadmap for Safer Communities, a citywide violence prevention strategy within two pinpoint areas in the Kensington area. Mission area three, reducing the number of unsheltered individuals. Uh, through the work of resilience, we've expanded emergency and temporary housing to 220 beds. We've added 210 long-term housing opportunities for those in need. We've provided over 45,000 bed nights for over 500 people. Uh, the work we have left to do in that area is grow the number of low barrier permanent supportive housing units within the whole city with a target of 250 per year citywide. We've also made a commitment to the district council members that we would uh, look to repurpose and re relocate our respite centers off of Kensington Avenue to allow fuller use and setting up that community for more business purpose, business oriented purposes. Mission area four, reduction of uh, trash and litter. So far we've hosted seven large scale clean community volunteer cleanups. Thank you to the folks behind me, not only the city staff, but also to the community for participating and volunteering with us each month. On those cleanups, we've removed over 600 abandoned vehicles, launched new programs to remove discarded needles. We've set up safety needle drop boxes and started a weekly street sweeping program. Work left to do, continue widespread community cleanups, install 10 more large needle drop, box, drop, box, drop boxes this summer, expand the doors and windows program citywide, launch a volunteer community ambassadors program to where we want to figure out a way to provide a stipend to folks on various blocks to sort of help us keep areas clean and help us target uh, quality of life issues that we could then address as a city government. Mission area five, reducing overdoses and the spread of infectious diseases. We've conducted nearly 200, 2,500 HIV tests within the Kensington community. We've distributed opioid prescription guidelines to more than 6,000 healthcare, 16,000 healthcare providers by mail and 1,300 providers directly by in-person outreach. We've provided all fire department ambulances with leave behind naloxone to distribute after responding to overdose calls. We still need to uh, expand our needle exchange program, continue distribution and training of naloxone, and support the, uh, and support the research into the establishment of possible establishment of overdose prevention sites uh, throughout the city. Mission area six, increased treatment options. So far, we've launched treatment availability database, which provides real-time information about availability of beds to both the provider community and to the community at large. So now that folks wanna, if folks have a person that wants help, we able to try to do that a little more on demand. Folks could go and see where these beds are located, what's the availability to be able to connect people in a more rapid fashion. We've expanded the warm handoff program at Temple, Maine and Episcopal campuses. We've contracted with First Step Staffing Solutions to connect individuals to recovery, connect individuals in recovery to entry level employment. And we've created an EMS alternative response unit staffed by paramedics and case manager to offer warm handoffs and help us sort of divert some of our EMS calls and be able to address more important uh, issues and circumstances. Work left to do. We need to expand, we need to expand our 27 treatment capacity, increase the number of hospital making warm handoffs into treatment, adopt additional provider payment strategies that incentivize high quality care, 
and continue to identify and rapidly address barriers to, to care and treatment. Last mission area, mobilize the community resources. So far, we form and convene the community, community advisory committee. We've recruited over hundreds of volunteers, hosted 25 community and civic meetings, launched dedicated bilingual 311 pods specific to the Kensington area to resolve quality of life service issues in this community at a more rapid pace. Work left to do is work with the community on plans to sustain a resilience project work beyond 2019 and raise public and private funding to leverage local investments to support community organizations. That, in a nutshell, is a report out on the work we've been doing. Like we've acknowledged, we know there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, I'll let Brian walk through some of, the, some, of, some of what's next. A big piece of what's next for us is working with you all, working with the police, working with our law enforcement partners and a community as it relates to a public disruption strategy. Thank you, too. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick because I think we want to get to questions fairly, fairly soon. Um, first, we, we know we still have a lot of work to do. Um, if resilience is going to be successful, it has to be sustainable. We can't continue uh, the same level of staff and resources that we have put in, in over the last several months. Um, but we also can't leave a vacuum, um, which is what we're not going to do. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the community to establish cross-sector partnerships um, to sustain the resilience project. Part of that is going to be around fundraising and engaging the business community uh, and the foundation community in a very real way so that they invest, invest here uh, to support the, the neighborhood. Uh, we also need to develop and implement a community development uh, plan, um, economic development to bring back that commercial corridor as well as provide affordable housing and so much of our vacant stock. Uh, we need to expand the successful aspects of our work into neighborhoods with similar needs and we also need to coordinate with the implementation of Philadelphia uh, Roadmap for Safer Communities. Um, and that's where I'm going to actually stop. The one thing I am most frustrated by with resilience, the thing that keeps me up at night, the thing that I know, Councilwoman, you are most frustrated by, is the level of violence in this community. Um, we have not succeeded. We have not succeeded in, in curbing the open-air drug dealing, and we have not succeeded in, in curbing the open-air drug use. We have not succeeded in dealing with the shootings that are happening on a daily basis. Um, we have to be more aggressive. Um, the police department and outreach have already started a, a more aggressive campaign to deal with open-air uh, drug use. Uh, we are exploring different models that, have, uh, that other cities have started to, to open, including a model in Louisville called the Living Room which um, is similar to a model that, that uh, Councilwoman Sanchez brought to us, which allows us to take people into custody, bring them to a place where social services are offered. Um, while I don't think we can detain them, um, it, we can certainly engage them in a different level and disrupt the behavior that is disrupting these people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, because that's really what this comes down to. We can't allow the illegal activity to continue. Um, I want to thank all the people behind us. I want to thank the staff who have, uh, who have worked tirelessly on this issue. This has taken a lot of time. This is draining work. Uh, it is hard work. Uh, and how they do it on a day in and day out basis is something that I, I question. Um, because frankly, I don't think I could do some of the work that they do. Um, and I also want to thank the community. Um, what all of you have had to suffer and work through um, we have, is a failure on government's part. Um, and not just local government, but on, uh, on federal and state government, um, failure on the business community, on the philanthropic community. Um, and I apologize for those failures. And I, you know, those failures have happened for the last several decades. Um, the lack of investment, the lack of attention that your communities have, have suffered. Um, but I want to thank you for working with us. I know we have had our bumps. I know we have had uh, have had some bruises and scrapes, um, but I hope you know at this point that uh, I, what I mean is, what I say is what I mean. Um, and whether you agree with me or disagree, uh, we are going to, we are not going anywhere. Um, and I appreciate uh, the support, uh, the words of encouragement, um, and sometimes the words of, uh, uh, of keeping me honest and my feet to the ground and my feet to the fire, um, because we couldn't do this work without, without these people. Um, they are an incredible community. Um, that I am in awe of every day. Um, and so we're happy to, to take your questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for your commentary and questions. Councilman Sanchez. 
Um, first, let me say that there's no question, there's never been a question in my mind that, that the administration has really taken itself out of the traditional box and try to address this. I think resilience is an example of an all hands on deck approach. And I agree with you, we, we can work hard and now we got to work smart. Um, I think part of the frustration that we have from our residents has been, and, and I want to strongly um, highlight for you as you move to the sustainability of resilience, I think it's really important that over the, this summer, and I think the test is going to be what we tell residents today this summer is going to look like for them, we have lost the trust of the residents. And we've lost the trust of the residents because there have been parallel conversations with providers, with whether you talk about the safe injection site, whether you talk about the Drexel study, which many people believe is very flawed and that's a separate conversation. What can you tell me today that is going to help us get to a place because there is no trust and faith in us, right? And I say us, and I include ourselves, because as Councilwoman Bass says, we're all in this together. What one, two, three things people are going to see differently this summer that is going to help us gain the trust that we are committed to restore their quality of life in every single block in this community? I think um, there's gonna be two things that I, I think are gonna be um, key. One is our law enforcement strategy. Um, how are we going to deal with public safety? How are we tackling uh, um, open air drug use and open air drug dealing? Um, what is our aggressive um, policing strategy look like? And I, I certainly can bring up the deputy commissioner and the inspector to talk through that in a little bit more detail. Um, but we have to disrupt the, uh, the illegal activity that is happening outside of these people's doors. And if we can't do that, we're never going to be able to earn the trust of, of this community. Um, and we are committed to finding ways to do that. Now, we may, what we try this summer may not work. And then we're going to try something new in August. And then we're going to try something new in September. And we're going to be honest and have those conversations that when we fail, I own that. Um, I think the other issue that we're going to have to continue to work on is um, the cleanliness and litter. Uh, we can't have kids being stepping on needles. We can't have um, bags of trash and human feces laying on our sidewalks. And we have to figure out a way to maintain the level of cleanli cleanliness that we are committed to. Um, we started a, a street cleaning pilot in this community. Um, we have learned very quickly um, that it's a large area with, with uh, a, a significant issue and we're gonna have to dedicate more resources to it. Um, but we need to be visible, we need to continue the work, um, and we also need to continue these dialogues. Um, I need Shannon Farrell to yell at me. I need Marnie to yell at me. Um, and then neither of them are shy to do it. Um, but I need to make sure that we have open communication that, so that when we are making mistakes, when there are things happening in the street that we don't know, or, or frankly, I say some boneheaded thing in the press, which has been known to happen, they should have the outlet to be able to have that communication so we can at least begin, um, begin, that, begin that dialogue. We can't do this without the community. Um, we have to have their trust. We have to have a working relationship, and we're committed to doing whatever we can to do, make that happen. Just to add the third thing, in addition to public safety, in addition to cleanliness, I think what you'll see from us this summer is a more focused effort on providing services on demand, on site in those communities. All of the mission areas, whether it's mission area five, mission area six, We've been talking about how to coordinate, and we can have Liz and others come up and talk in detail about this, but we've been talking about how to coordinate our outreach efforts to where people see us, to where we're going to the places where there are the most folks visible on the streets of the community. We want to do that in a more deliberate way to bring those services to those corners, hopefully get those folks access to those services and helping them either get into treatment, go back home, or something. But I think in addition to the two things Brian mentioned, that's something you're going to see from us in a more visible way throughout the course of the summer. Before, and I, I do want D.C. Sullivan to come up and um, give us the public safety strategy. We started a 311 Kensington Resilience um, phone. Is that, wor that, is that still working? Yes. Okay. Yes. So one of the biggest issues as we deploy people 
from or move people from whether Emerald Street that started popping up again or others, we have more and more people breaking into vacant properties along the city. So in addition to the public safety that DC Sullivan will speak to, what, what is the time frame? Because what I don't want us to do, right, is what is the time frame between people calling that people have broken into a house, the LNI response, and does the emergency declaration allow us to do things differently versus this 30 day citation to clean and seal? How can we make sure that within 24, 48 hours, we're reclaiming these properties and sealing these properties quickly? I, I would say one of the things we're doing is through the, through the, um, through L and I, quite frankly, provide more resources. We've been spending overtime sort of every weekend for the past few months working on clean and seal requests in this community. A lot of times that's on a, you know, we get a lot of requests through police, whether it's something on a crime initiative or something regarding public safety. We tend to do those things within 24 to 48 hours notice. As much as we can, we want to do the due process of providing a violation and sending it to folks. But at the same time, we are responding to those a little rapidly. We've sort of, because of this project, we've probably eliminated the notification process as it relates to handling the bandy cars in a different way, right? So we're more rapidly getting to those requests. I think the mayor or Joanna could come up and talk to sort of the volume we've been seeing in 311, but we've towed over hundreds of cars in this area in a more rapid process, 600 cars in this area in a more rapid process. Uh, l and commissioner has committed that overtime resource to us until we need it quite frankly. Uh, so we, we've been doing that and doing things in a more urgent fashion in this area as it relates to this emergency declaration. But I'll let Joe talk about the specific time frames as it relates to the 311 pod. Good evening, Councilwoman. Joan Otero Cruz, Deputy Managing Director of Community Services. So since the pod's been up, we have um, over 14,000 requests that have come in. All of our service and, um, departments, and I can get you the, specific, the specificity, but it's about 34% um, of an improvement in terms of the wraparound. So each, each one is distinct, and we can get you those details. But in overall, it's about 34% of an improvement in terms of the wraparound um, response um, to each request. And that includes Litter, L&I. Uh, we've been working with the Clean and Seals in, in particular. So what I'd like to see for this summer, and I want folks to leave here knowing that we're going to use the emergency declaration to change the rules and regulations by which we normally, as you know, when I get the email, it's because they got the response, it's 30 day, we have to cite the owner. If we, if we know it's an emergency and someone calls for a vacant property, you don't need to respond today, but over the next week, we need to say, we're gonna respond in four days, in five days, we're gonna seal the property, um, because that's what shows us that we're gonna respond differently if we have an acknowledgement that we have 500 people in addiction, homeless, in a very concentrated area. We, we agree, and in, as a part of our weekly executive team, Joanna, that's one of the report outs. Quite frankly, Joanna goes through what that weekly 311 call request is. Those departments are in the room, we respond, we talk about the time frame, and we, we do that every, that's an every Monday sort of opportunity for us. In addition to that, um, we do have supervisors that are following up with the residents just to let them know where we are in the process. They may not like the response, but at least they're getting feedback as to where it's at in the process. Can we figure out, again, as you guys have really thought outside the box about these calls, can we figure out a way that, again, when we're talking about people squatting, taking over properties, um, when you call people back so that you elevate the level, right? Yes. We, this issue of, of people on blocks is, again, we're spreading people out. Just because people are not in a major encampment doesn't mean people aren't encamping. They're just all over the place. Um, and then how many beds, we're no longer in code blue, how many beds are currently available and how are we really doing warm handoffs so that, yes, we want the house clean and sealed because we don't want people actively using in there, but how many of those are turning into people actually going somewhere? 
We'll have a representative from OHS come up and answer that question. Thanks, Chair. Council members, I'm Roberta Cancellier, the Deputy Director for Housing Services. Social worker, uh, mom of family members that struggle with addiction, and a proud member of the, uh, of the resilience team. So we've added about 220 beds, emergency shelter beds, for people who are experiencing homelessness. And those people can get to those beds either by primarily by outreach, um, by walk-ins, and by some of the warm handoffs from some of the systems that you've heard about. How long? So, again, this is an issue of coordination. When we go to seal a property, um, part of what we need to think about, will outreach teams or other people be called so that we're trying, again, because the level of human trafficking, some of the prostitution is up, can we ensure that we do a little bit connectivity around that, right? To ensure that when we're cleaning and sealing and potentially removing people. now that we're doing it and that there's something there. Yeah. Yes, so that's the benefit of 311, right? Coming in through the central for service days, encampments, and other kinds of things that allows us to coordinate at that level. I know you said you were going to have D.C. Sullivan come up real quick. Sure. And then we want to get to our community panel. We appreciate everyone's patience uh, in this heat. I don't want to turn on the fans because then we can't listen to each other, but... You can begin your testimony. Hello again. Uh, excuse me? Please, please state your name for the record. <laughs> Good evening, members of council. My name is Deputy Commissioner Joe Sullivan, and I command patrol operations for the Philadelphia Police Department. I am also the department's representative to the Resilience Project. Hello again. I'd just like to say, in, in terms of the Resilience Project, to begin with, one of, the, one of the, as my boss, Mr. Abernathy, mentioned, there are times when we have missteps, and certainly in the beginning, uh, we realized that we may have taken too soft of, of an approach to some unacceptable sidewalk behaviors. The, the injection, the defecation, the urination, uh, that is being addressed in a much more law enforcement center way in terms of stopping people. It begins with an encounter, and then we find out that person has won it. Uh, at the same time, we still offer services, but we make it clear that this type of behavior just is not going to be accepted anymore, and it's not acceptable to do this in front of someone's home, and that it's going to eventually result in, in arrest. And we have been seeing some results. Silver, and Silver Street and Sterner Street, at, right there at Emerald, had started to become almost another encampment. Uh, Inspector Bachmeyer's here. He can talk about that in greater detail. Um, utilizing those tactics, that was that was that was eliminated, and two individuals were actually wanted on warrants for for rather serious matters. One of the issues that I do want to address, though, is um, in terms of marijuana. It is the position of this police department that the possession of marijuana, user possess, personal possession, is best handled by the issuance of civil violation notices, and by doing so, we have kept thousands of young men and women out of the criminal justice system. It's been, in our mind, a successful program. And we certainly do not think that people that simply use marijuana are violent people because that is certainly not true. But the people that sell marijuana illegally here in this neighborhood and in neighborhoods all throughout our city are making a lot of money. And they're not afraid to use violence in order to protect their markets. So we continue to enforce the laws against marijuana sales for that reason, and we will not stop. And there are situations where we believe that persons that we have made a case are selling marijuana because they know to keep small amounts on them, they have been not charged, and we have been directed to issue them a CVN. I don't like the use of term liar or lying to because that's not what this department does. 
marijuana is a problem. We will continue to enforce all the drug laws, um, including marijuana, against the people that are selling it, the people that are benefiting from it financially, and the people that are utilizing violence on these streets here and throughout our city to maintain control of those markets. <clears throat> when we see a dealer selling, we have to stop the person that they're selling to. There are two different charges. There's one charge for the sale of marijuana. There's another charge for purchasing marijuana. In order to make a conspiracy for the person selling marijuana, we have to document that we observed the sale and we stopped the person that bought the drugs. This is where a lot of the misperception comes in or maybe the, the, there is a difference of opinion between my, myself and the district attorney's office. In regards to theft from auto, this department Arrests for theft from water are up significantly citywide. The problem that we have is bail decisions. The people that could break into cars, they do it. Most of them are recidivists. Many of them have been arrested over 30 times. I personally check bail decisions. I'm seeing people that have been more than 30 arrests being given an ROR and they are released. One captain said at Comstat, on average, the persons that are arrested for theft from auto are back on the street within five hours. The, how in, it's very hard for me to impact the quality of life when crimes like theft from auto are not being taken seriously. No one suggests that first time offenders should go to jail, but something has to be done with persons that are breaking into cars over and over and over again and costing people money that they simply do not have. This department continues to make arrests for prostitution with a large focus in this area right here. The policy of the district attorney's office, if a person has less than three priors, they do not charge. Well, it's a little hard to get the three priors when you're not being charged. That being said, we continue to enforce the law, make those arrests, and they are not charged, but they have a significant impact in the people that live here in this neighborhood. So therefore, we will continue to enforce those laws. There have been 64 declinations for prostitution by the district attorney's office in the 24th district this year. In terms of violation of the Uniform Firearms Act, I am I'm very proud to say that the department has over 873 arrests for violations of the Uniform Firearms Act this year citywide. That's a 37% increase over last year, and I think you can make the connection between that and the violence um, that's occurring throughout the city. We have taken over 2,000 guns off the street this year, which is a significant increase. Now speaking specifically in resilience, we got off to a bad start this year. We have a, a total of 12 homicides have occurred this year in the resilience area. But in response to that, Commissioner Ross in March sent 14 additional footbeats into the 24th district to be deployed within the resilience area at seven different locations. Since March, we have only had, and I hate to say only, only, but we have had one homicide. So I think you can see the impact of those footbeats that they are having in terms of, and one area where I certainly do agree um, with the district attorney is the importance of relationships with the community. The reason that the commissioners specifically ordered that these officers be footbeats would be that in addition to enforcing the law, they would not be in cars with barriers between themselves and the community, and they would make relationships, begin to build trust, people, somewhere there that people could talk to. And so far, I think with, that it, you have to say that it is wildly, well, significantly successful. I mean, Councilman Squeal asked that question about the broken windows theory. I couldn't agree with the district attorney even more. I, I, he was spot on. In my, in my opinion as well. We do not go out into a neighborhood and stop people for every minor violation. That goes strictly against the whole theory or the ability to establish trust and build relationships with the community. But what, one of the things that we do have done in resilience is abandon autos, and with the help of Mr. Alexander addressing abandoned houses, abandoned lots, troubled tr uh, businesses that are not operating in the best interest of the community. These are ways that I, I, I prefer the term quality of life, where we address quality of life issues with 
but at the same time do it in a way that we are targeting and impacting those people that we know are committing crimes, are committing acts of violence, and are impacting the quality of life of the residents of this neighborhood instead of targeting the neighborhood, which which certainly we have seen in other cities, and Ferguson was an excellent example of how poorly that works. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to you for any questions. Thank you. I just want to take a moment and thank Inspector Bachmeyer and welcome our new captain, Captain Fisher, <laughs> into this craziness. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I do want to allow, I know the community is to be patient. I want to recognize Councilman Green, who has joined us. Um, if you gentlemen can stick around, I'm going to let the panel of community residents come up, and then if we need to come back to all of you. Thank you. So we have Sh Shannon Farrell, Marnie Allman, Annette Mears, and Felix Torres Colon will be the first panel. And then we'll have Ken Paul, Pete Smith, and Sterling Johnson. And I think I saw Leo. We'll have you come in on the second panel. Thank you. And Ms. Farrell, if you want to state your name for the record and begin with your testimony. Okay. My name is Shannon Farrell. I'm president of the Harrogate Civic Association. So for the past 18 months, I have been a part of meetings with the managing director's office and part of this resilience project. And for 18 months, I go in every month and I ask the same questions. One of the things that they tell us is, that with the demand being so high, it is hard to go after the supply because when they do make arrests of the drug dealers, more come very quickly to replace them. So a couple of things I wanted to bring up was having listened to that, and I believe that to be true because I'm witnessing this. We were told that most barriers have been lifted for the drug users in our community to access treatment. And recent, so for the most part, I always went and spoke on behalf of the residents that live in homes and have been there long before we have been under siege by the increase that's like on steroids in our neighborhood with this opiate issue. And so I had said a couple of months ago, I was gonna start looking at it from the other point of view and seeing what the problem is, because I think for the most part, sometimes we don't listen to the drug users because we think they come up with every excuse to not reach, go into rehabs and get help. So a couple of the things that recently have come to light is the fact that the CBH does not allow detox for people who are on opiates. They can for benzos, but if you choose to not go into a CBH and go on to a medically assisted treatment, you are turned away for help. And so that's a barrier. If they don't want to go on to medical treatment because they can't make that time commitment, if they go on methadone and then they miss it, they don't get their dosage, they go back to using. If they, this should be their choice. Their choice should be detox or go on some medically assisted, medical assistant tr treatments. They're not being given the choice. That's against their rights. That's not fair. And that is not helping us with the users that want to access treatment. The other thing recently, which I know there was a protest yesterday about, is the smoking ban that the CBH has put on their providers. That now if they want to access treatment, they're not allowed to smoke cigarettes. We're setting them up for failure. Now we're asking them to just give everything up and walk away, and we're not letting them access treatment, and then I meet with the managing director's office who tells me they don't want treatment, and that they, we need them to go into treatment to get rid of the drug dealers in the neighborhood, but we're not lowering all the barriers. So this is like not working for me. This does not work. The CBH city, Brian Abernathy, needs to tell them to lift that smoking ban, and that these people have rights, and if they want to go into detox and not go on Suboxone or Methadone, that's their choice. That helps get them off of the streets. That gets them away from keeping you know, these drug dealers who are violent in our community on the streets. So if you're going to tell me that the problem is the demand, then you have to make sure that the demand can seek help when they need it. Also, these drug dealers, they're murderers. They're killing the drug users and they're killing us when they shoot us. This is a problem. This cannot continue. The violence in my neighborhood is out of hand. Two weeks ago, I was sitting on my porch with my father, 
with 30 bullets riding out down the street where an 18-year-old pregnant teenager took three bullets in her chest. That never used to happen here before. That's not acceptable. There's no excuse for this. They don't only kill each other. They're killing us and hurting us. And this is far too long. 18 months I've met with this city and go in with the same complaints and they just keep getting worse. And it has to end. I've enjoyed the cleanups in the neighborhood that the Resilience Project has done. I've taken part in it. I enjoy the fact that they like to sit and listen to us, but it is not changing for anybody. And I feel like now it's been playing two sides against the middle. We need to get together. Now I, I do, I have post-safe injection sites. That's about where we differ. Other than that, this needs to be done. These people need the help. And they continue to tell us that they don't want to seek treatment when you're not letting them seek it. It's just amazing to me. You can't blame them for everything and not give them the help. We cannot continue to allow violent drug dealers to run our neighborhood. They control the drug users. They control what happens if we're allowed to sit outside. When them 30 bullets rang out a couple weeks ago, them bullets went into the homes where children were living, so now they're not even safe inside their homes. So now keeping our kids off the street doesn't matter. The bullets go through the walls in the windows. We cannot afford to move. We are a poor community. We cannot continue to take this. It is not okay to continue to make us live like this. And I don't know if there's the district attorney. He wants to blame you know, other things for it. I don't know. The police do not usually give me that excuse. What I'm told, it is the demand needs to go away. And we are not doing a good job at that at all. These drug dealers are getting younger in my neighborhood. On that corner where them 30 bullets flow, there are 15, 18 year olds that are dealing in that area. That's insane. We never had that before. So now our kids are seeing this, being traumatized, and they're seeing their friends and their older friends' siblings now taking part in this. Before it used to be the drug dealers weren't from our area. Now they're teaching our kids to get involved in that life. And I know there's a plan, there's a five-year plan, but we need here and now. Five-year plan is not good for my child's that are children that are 10 and 18. Old. 10 and five will be. 15 and 10, their childhood's gone. It's not fair, it is not fair to them. We cannot continue to live like this. We don't have much, it gets stolen. You know, the drug users do these things to support their habit. We need them to be taken care of. We need more things in place to help get them into treatment, make treatment what they want, make it so that if they're doing something, treatment is like a better option for them. We need to move them in off the streets. We need to reunite them with their families. I've done it twice. Twice I've helped people reunite with their families. That was the big reason that they left that neighborhood and went and got help was because our family came and got them. They need, we need that, we need that support. We need to do a lot more than we're doing. You cannot continue to make us and allow us to live like this. We have children that are shot. Some have survived, some have not. They are not, you know, they, it's not okay for this to continue to happen. In 18 months, I've sat with this city three times a month at the least, and said, please do something about this. And it has not changed. It has increased. My neighborhood now has more users, more dealers, and more violent crime happening in our neighborhood than it did 18 months ago. So as I appreciate the efforts and the fact that everybody's paying attention and not just ignoring it because it's Kensington and Harrogate and nobody cares anyway, the reason that you're here is because it's been contained here for years. So it's, it, more has to be done. More has to be done. Thank you. My name is Marnie Omet, Marnie Omet Lockery, M A R N I E A U M E N T hyphen L O U G H R E R E Y. All of you sitting there know me. Marie, I've walked around with you and the district attorney when he stood there and said he will not prosecute anybody that's in a safe injection site trying to keep them from overdosing, and he won't inv he won't prosecute the people that have health issues, mental health, and are using the drugs. We've asked them many times, why don't you 302 somebody? Somebody's out of control and there is a mechanism there for the police to 302 them. We have been told that it cannot be done. I have met with Senator Street. I've met with Senate, uh, State Representative Angel Cruz. I've reached out to the other delegates in Philadelphia, the senators and the representatives, and I've reached out to Congressman uh, Boyle. We will be meeting next week. There has to be a way that us, the law-abiding citizens' rights come into play. 
None of us should have to have our nine-year-old grandson or child watch somebody inject themselves in a penis with a needle. Watch somebody inject somebody else in their neck with a needle. You cannot tell me anybody in their right mind is allowing that to happen. There has to be a way to end this. If you walk up and down G Street, I have open air markets 24 seven. And yes, they arrested somebody on G Street. They arrested somebody on Hilton Street. One person out of 10, the rest of them are still standing there and they replace them. They go to Walmart and buy the $40 little canopy thing set up underneath of it. They bring their kids there to play. This is ridiculous. And then everybody feels bad when somebody's shot because they never get shot. Their kid might get shot. My kid might get shot. Shannon's kid might get shot. But they're the worst shooters around. They never hit each other. You call Krasner here, and I won't even give him the respect of a district attorney because he's nothing but a defense attorney. And he's proven that here tonight. We had questions last night. Andre, you were at visitation last night. We had questions there, and they said that the district attorney would have to answer him to tonight's meeting. All he did was say his piece and he got up and walked out. He's not answering anything. You've launched an, a warrant initiative resulting in 180 arrests and getting $262 worth of narcotics and 20 guns off the street and your reduced criminal missionary too. Are they running warrants on everybody? Why, if the captains are, and the officers are arresting people because they don't have enough charges, they get put right back on the street? He's never gonna get them to three charges because he's not giving it to them. We are being held hostage and victims in our own community. Some of us can move. We're too stupid. We're staying here and we're fighting for our community. You come and you hold these meetings and then you go back to City Hall and you hold these meetings. Some of you will come out and walk around. Some of you will give us that courtesy. But you're not holding other people accountable. Everybody sitting here just ran for re-election last month. Every single one of you's got re-elected. You are all shoe-ins come November, aren't you? Every single one of you sitting here. Councilwoman has nobody running against her on the Republican side. Mark, do you? Do you? Are you going to beat them? You know you will. The council, large people sitting here, they're the five Democratic people that are going up for re-election. The other two will be Republicans. They have the fight, not yous. What are yous doing to actually help us? What are you doing to make a difference in our community? What are you doing to untie the hands of the police officers, even the managing director's office? We all seen the Drexel report. We know what it says. You know what they did? They gave out $5 gift cards and tokens to the junkies to say, yes, we want an opioid prevention site in our neighborhood. Of course you do. You want your Narcan. But on that same day, on election day, I had a junkie in the store, and I will call them a junkie. They were in the store at G in Allegheny when he bumped into the kid in the store and the kid said something back. Outside, he stabbed that kid. That kid wound up in Temple Hospital. Does anything happen to the junkie? No. Oh, he's got a problem. Yes, but we have a bigger one because you all are allowing them to stay in our community. They came from Gurney Street. The ones from Gurney Street, they're probably already in the system somewhere getting help. We have people coming every day adding to K&A. I looked at your, your area here. You're going to start at K&A. You're going to go up 8th Street and then over to Sedgley and then back down and around. That doesn't take in G Street, F Street, Hilton Street, Weymouth, Russell, Lippincott, Willard, Madison. Hill. It's not taken in the rest of the area. It's not taken in the area where people are getting shot. You had a police officer shoot a homeless man at G in Tioga. That homeless man has a family. They just didn't want him there because he's an addict. That homeless man walked up and down with silver in his hand going like this. That officer came from another thing. Do I like the fact that that officer had to shoot somebody? No. Was that man violent that night? No. Has that man been violent? Yes. Yes, he has. He screamed at people. He's yelled. He's kicked your cars. He jumps out in between cars. I have people that don't let their children drive home that night, even though it's the fastest way to their house, because of that man being there. That is a sad state that that man was shot begging for money to get his drugs. You are letting every single person, you're letting these officers stay in harm way. And if it's not you, 
then it's that district attorney. Because the police tell you one thing and he comes back with another. I'm tired. I'm tired of being lied to. I'm tired of going back to a community that says, I sat at a meeting at the MSB building. I sat at a meeting of visitation. I sat at the meeting at Harrogate, Juniana, South Kensington. In this, this is where I hold my community meetings once a month. Once a month. I'm tired of doing meetings for us to listen to the same rhetoric. You ask the same questions, and so far, little things have been changed. Little things have been done, but not enough. The cleanups, that's great. When are we going to have the sweep officers start going through the bags of trash that people are dumping and start finding them? And then when are you going to change it so that you can't have six, seven, eight, nine fines coming back? If it's a landlord, start taking their properties. I guarantee you, you start taking their properties and reusing them, we can have a system. You want to clean up this neighborhood? Go start talking to the unions. Let them take every vacant, abandoned property that's sitting on a sheriff's sale list. Let us community groups work with the carpenters union, the electricians union, the plumbing union. Get them certified. Get them going. Get them fixed. Then let's take the women and children that are living in the shelters, the women and children that are out of abuse relationships, Put them back in our community. Let them come in. That'll open up a hell of a lot better in the shelters for you to take every addict and do what you want with them. You want to clean them up? Get a building. Take a city-owned building. Take a state-owned building. Take a federal-owned building. We've got plenty of schools that aren't being yours. Put them all in the school. Take them there. Bring the city services down to them. Let them stay someplace where they can't turn around and say, ah, I don't want this today, but I'll take my free food. They're getting free food, free shoes, free clothing, free haircuts. And then they get to just keep doing what they want. Meanwhile, us schmucks sitting here, we're paying mortgages, rent, gas, electric, water, food bills, clothing bills, hairdressers, for, for everything. We're being penalized and their ears are going hand over hand to keep giving them everything. Mount Airy people. There's a group up there. They feel sorry for them. That's great. You feel sorry for them. I understand the woman's son died from addiction. She didn't let him live in her house then. She let him go on the street. Now he's dead. I'm sorry about that. If you want to change the ones down here, I'll gladly drive them to your house and give them to you. I'm sure every one of us will do that. We're tired of being told we're going to try something new. I understand Brian and Tumar. They can't just do what they want to do. I understand you can't always do what you want to do. Because if it was up to us, I think half of us right now are ready to take a baseball bat and show you how we really feel. But then I guarantee the district attorney will charge us. I don't know the answer. I don't have all the answers. And I know that you don't have all the answers. But we have been going through these meetings for almost two years. Two years we have been discussing this and have some improvements, maybe, but with every improvement that comes on, we get 22 steps back to where we started from. And that's not fair to us. There has to be something that can be done differently. Go to the state, go to the federal government. Everybody says this is a crisis nationwide. Let Philadelphia be a pilot program to change some things. I get everybody wants to take care of the addicts' rights. That's great. But what about our rights? And just so we understand, there's a big difference between a homeless person living on the street that's there because she's escaping an abusive relationship, lost their job, and lost their home, to somebody that wants to be there because they want to keep sticking that needle in their body. That's a big difference. I'm tired of them being called homeless. They're not homeless because they're doing exactly what they want to do. They're saying, screw you to the rest of you. We get to come and go and do what we want, and we have absolutely no penalties. How do you teach a child to do the right thing when you, the city, are allowing people every day to break the law and nothing happens to them? I was with Tumor Alexander, and I hate to put you on the spot, big guy, but he said he did a walkthrough, and he came down here at 3 o'clock when the schools were getting out. The apathy on the children's face just bobbing and weaving and going between the needles and the addicts is ridiculous. When we grew up, yeah, everybody knew somebody that did drugs, but it was never, ever like this. Kensington was never like this. Maria, we, we spent $200,000 at McPherson Library. We worked with Kaboom. Okay. The improvements that got put in there. 
The kids can't even go in and enjoy it. They lost their park. They lost their, their, their safety net. That's not fair. Those kids had a phenomenal time getting to, to play in that playground, getting to put the benches where they wanted them. They came out with the flyers, the city, the managing director's office, the council people, Wells Fargo. Everybody came out, they worked and built the playground together. We had one needle in that park maybe once a month they were finding. Now, you can't walk there and there's a box for them to drop it in. They can't even drop them in the box. You're giving them every opportunity and they're throwing it back in your face. Enough has to be enough. Something has to change, something has to be done differently. And it's sad to say, but you have to be held accountable for it. And it's not all your mess, I get that, I really do. There's a sign in Las Vegas that says, go to Kensington, they got the best drugs. That's offensive. Not only is it offensive to me as being born and raised in Kensington, I've lived on the 700 block of Willard Street since 1970. But that's offensive to this city. And that should be offensive to you, the council people that are trying to help people. I don't know what all the answers are, and I'm thankful that you come into the community and have these meetings because it's really hard for everybody to get down there. I'm even thankful that you're doing it at night because some of us really do work. Not everybody here is, you know, just sitting around doing drugs. Some of us really work. But something has to be done and something has to be changed. Thank you. My name is Felix Torres Colon, and I'm the executive director of New Kensington CDC. Before, I have prepared remarks, but one thing I wanted to just share that struck me, everybody keeps talking about quality of life issues, right? And I feel that that, that minimizes, that hides, that takes away what's really happening in our neighborhood. Because what's happening in our neighborhoods, and we now are offices in the neighborhoods, so I can speak with more authority than maybe I could in the past, is trauma-inducing. And when you get trauma, it has all kinds of bad effects. And in fact, they've done studies that kid, young children, it actually changes how their brains actually work. And not for the good. So, you know, I think when you talk about quality of life issues, uh, I understand what you mean, but what we have here are trauma-inducing damage and danger to our kids, our neighbors, my employees. Um, so it's more than quality of life. Quality of life to me is like you're not cutting your grass. Not that you're avoiding needles, not that you're watching people shoot up every day, not that you're seeing people have sex in public, and not that people treat you as if you were dirt because you're not an addict or you're not dealing. So, so with that, NKCDC's mission is to strengthen the physical, social, and economic fabric of the community. We do that in a bunch of ways. We do economic development. We do real estate development. Uh, we talk about community engagement. Uh, we do community engagement. We cut vacant lots and clean vacant lots. We also have a housing department that helps people with utility issues, with uh, title issues, with foreclosure, as well as help folks who want to buy a home. Uh, and before I, I, I go forward, I just wanted to say that these two years of meetings that we've been having, the housing people for the city have never been there. And I'm talking about the homeless folks. I'm talking about the people who control the $20 million in trust fund, who decide who gets tax credit money. The people who make the serious decisions about building affordable housing in this community have never been to any of those meetings, right? So I'm always, and I bring it up every meeting practically. So I'm always surprised. So I'm, I'm glad to hear Brian talk about looking at development, a building of housing, taking out some of these vacant properties and doing, actually doing something with them. But as long as housing is out in La La Land, that's never gonna happen. We, you know, we're on, as I said, we're at NKCDC, moved to Ruth Street. That was our commitment when we started working in the neighborhood. 
Ruth and Somerset is a tough area. Everything people talk about, we see day in and day out. For the staff, my staff that work, that used to work in the neighborhood every day, the organizers and the commercial folks, they used to see all the stuff that we've talked about. Now, even my accountant sees people sh shooting up. So it has been a, 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 an, an amazing change for us um, and, and made us more passionate about what we're doing because some of us just didn't get it. Just like some people don't get it, right? Um, I think the, uh, I think first I want to say we're fortunate we have people like Shannon, like the folks of SMBL. Uh, I forgot your first name. Barney, because these are warriors, and the warriors have not given up, and they're fighting as much as they can, but we need help. The summer's coming, and everybody admits the summer's gonna be a lot worse, right? We can already see it, right? I go out of my office, and I notice that the regulars are changing. In other words, we're getting more regulars who come down, go to the drug, drug house down our, they live our street, or hang out in our area. So we need to do, we need to develop, discuss, pilot new approaches. And I believe that's great uh, what the council is doing and looking at and some of the stuff that the MDO wants to do. But in order to be successful, we need to respect and learn from the residents, the community institutions, and local businesses. You know, we talked about the Drexel study. To me, it's a clear example of how we get ignored. Uh, it is not the first time nor the last time that a voice of a poor community has been ignored, challenged, disparaged by outsiders and the elite. Community meetings, feedback from the civics and CDCs, overwhelming direct negative response of the residents in various ways and platforms weren't good enough. Drexel decided had to do a study, which is totally false, to show that everybody in the community didn't know what the hell they were talking about. That is insulting. That is racist. That is classist. You know, you ask these questions, and, and if you ask these questions, you kind of get what's going on. You ask, why was Gurney Street ignored for so long? You ask, why were the encampments allowed, allowed to start and thrive? Why were the 10,000 people that signed the, a, a petition in direct opposition to the OPS from the, the local residential neighborhoods. Why was that ignored? Why is the opposition of ASE, Impact Services, New Kensington CDC, Harrogate Civic Association, Southport Richmond Civic Association, Kensington Independent Civic Association, Bridesburg Civic Association, Juniata Park Civic Association, Port Richmond on Patrol and Civic, Huntington Emerald Park neighbors, Huntington Emerald near neighbors, Old Richardson Civic Association, and the uh, SMBL. Why, was, why is and was their opposition ignored, right? It's like, if you don't listen to the people, you're bound to fail. And if you're not listening to them because of institutional, or, or and bias, that's not going to change a thing. My last point is, I was uh, amused when the, the attorney said, well, we got to go by science. I said, well, if it's like the science of the Drexel study, we're screwed. Thank you. Okay, so our last panel, any questions for this panel? I know we want to bring back Brian Abernathy and stuff. And we're going to allow the last panel, which is Ken Paul, Pete Smith, and Leo Voloshin um, to come forward. And then we're going to ask um, the managing director's office to come back and we'll close it out. Then we are trying to honor the clock and be out of here by 8 o'clock. Um, my name is Leo Voloshin. 
I'm a business owner in the Harrogate neighborhood. I'm a Fishtown resident. Uh, my name, Volotion is V-O-L-O-S-H-I-N. So um, I <clears throat> have been in Philadelphia since 2003. I moved here right after college. I started and grew a business in Old Kensington at Cecil B. Moore and Hancock. We renovated a building there about 20,000 square feet into our offices and we outgrew our building and my real estate agent came calling and said, hey, you know what, I got this great building in Kensington, do you wanna come check it out? And I went and saw a beautiful old abandoned textile mill at Jasper and Monmouth. Um, over the last three years, we bought, renovated, and leased up that building at Jasper and Monmouth. We have 52 new businesses in um, the Kensington area. And <clears throat> while that's a huge success, the fact is that the quality of life in this neighborhood, and I know I appreciate um, Hector's comment is not the right term, it's completely abhorrent. You know, I, for years I drove through the tunnel in, under, on, on Frankfurt Avenue, and every couple of weeks I would send a midnight email to Maria and the mayor and say, what's going on here, how long is this gonna take? And it went on, and it went on, and it went on. And finally this year, this issue was quote unquote addressed. The result of the tunnels being moved, and I'm only speaking of the microcosm of where I am, and I appreciate that it's happening everywhere in this neighborhood. The result has been that that encampment moved to Ruth and Monmouth Street. And I just wanna share a little story about what happened a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago, there was a shooting, a homicide in fact, on Monmouth Street. The gentleman jumped who did the shooting, supposedly, and I don't know exactly how it turned out, but he jumped through an open house through the back, dropped his weapon in the rear yard, jumped the fence through our parking lot and exited. My wife diligently called the police department and you know, um, alerted to that to them and then they came and found the gentleman and you know, we went down to the roundhouse and made the statement. The next day I said, we need to seal this building. I called 311 and I said, hey, there's an open property on Monmouth Street. There was a murder and the murder and the shooter went through that property. Can you please seal it up? Sure. I'm like, how long is it gonna take? Six weeks. I said, six weeks, that's crazy. How come it's gonna take six weeks? There was a murderer and the man went through the house and dumped the gun. What's, why is it, that's just how long it takes. I said, well, who can I call? They said, call the 24th district, the captain of the 24th district. I said, okay, I called the captain of the 24th district. I said, sir, can, we, can you help us seal this up? Oh, no, no, no. That's up to 311. And I mean, that's unconscionable. How come it, and this is just, I want to talk about these kinds of issues. It has to be sped up. While, you know, I appreciate Tumar and uh, Brian talking about these issues, like, it doesn't take, you know, it shouldn't take me calling Andre and Maria, who, by the way, got it sealed in 24 hours, to make it happen. Now, the shootings on that corner continue at Ruth and Monmouth because Everybody from the tunnels moved to outside prevention point. If you drive by there at 11 p.m., I encourage all of you to do that tonight. Come back in the neighborhood. Come by at 11 p.m. There's 50 people shooting up, dealing drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what happened earlier this week? That same property, somebody went in there, broke open the seal, and started a fire, and that house burned down. And now the two houses right next door are completely ruined. I'm not exactly sure whether they were vacant or occupied, but I assume at least one of them was occupied. Those people do not have a home anymore. When is this gonna stop? What is it gonna take? You know, you talk about closing open air encampments. It's not, it's not happened. How about the guys who sit under the, as you know, I can't follow Marnie and Shannon's comments, but because I mean, wow, what about like, what great people who come here every, you know, this is maybe one of my first or second meetings, but there's guys at um, Hart and Jasper, they sit under a tent every day, 10 of them selling drugs. Like, what the hell? Why are they sitting under a tent? Why? I mean, I don't know how this works, but somehow that has to stop. It's completely unconscionable. I think that the 311 system needs to improve, and I think that the simple policing, and it's not simple, I understand, you have to prove it, and I don't know, I can't speak to what the DA is doing, but it's not working. Whatever is happening, it's not working, and it needs to change. We all know this, so my question, and it's funny, it's been testimony, because I'm just wondering, what's gonna happen next? I don't know, if it's not city council, but what's gonna happen? I didn't hear anything that's gonna happen. Somebody asked, what are the three things a year from now that we're gonna know, Maria, you asked that? 
I didn't hear anything that's going to be different. I heard more of the same. What's going to be different? My name is Ken Paul. I am president of PROPAC, Port Richmond on Patrol and Civic. Also board of director member of Impact Community Development Corporation. Uh, what I'm about to read is a testimony. Uh, it's a combination of all the civics that sit on this board. So I am speaking on the behalf of everybody that is dealing with the issues in this community. Once again, good evening, city council members and fellow members, neighbors. Thank you for the opportunity to amplify a voice of Philadelphia. For years, we have had exhaustive discussions about homelessness, the opioid crisis, trash in our streets, and supervised injections. We continue to work every day to address those challenges. But what needs to be heard today is that our city is losing control to gun violence. This stems in part from open narcotic trades and battles over the 125 corners in the 24th district. A couple of weeks ago, a pregnant teenager was shot by crossfire on Emerald Street when 30 bullets flew on the same corner for the same reason. It's unheard of, 30 bullets. As of June 20th, there had only been 20 days, and I will repeat, only 20 days in 2019 in Philadelphia when someone wasn't shot, wasn't. That, that stat is absurd. The impact of these events doesn't end with the violent killing. The ongoing negative effects of this trauma is real and known. At this point, it is well known that Philadelphians and communities exposed to high rates of violence and trauma die nearly 20 years earlier than those in affluent neighborhoods. This exposure to gun violence makes it nearly impossible for our children to feel safe when they step outside. We are setting our kids up to have a greater chance of anxiety, depression, suicidality, health problems, and future financial challenges. There is a direct line between exposure to violence and success in life. We all know this, but as a city, we can't seem to get control. This deadly tide is rising. To stem the tide of violence, we will partner with you as we always have. We believe that the city of Philadelphia needs to take immediate steps that include the following. Adding a fourth police service area to the 24th district. A more focused geography will allow targeted response and will allow closer relationships with neighbors who support law enforcement. Disrupting open air drug markets. We all know the corners where the drug dealers and users amass on a daily basis has been stated continuously today. We all watch them, we experience it every single day. Ramping up residential camera programs. Cameras on business are a great start but many of us are ready for cameras on our homes, but we don't have the means to purchase them. Increasing the pinpoint strategy. Evidently, this has been effective, so let's move it forward. Learning from other cities and the past, what has worked elsewhere and how do we bring other strategies to Philadelphia. Getting everyone in city government aligned when it comes to enforcement. We hear different stories from police, the district attorney's office, the managing director's office, and the mayor's office. Please be transparent and tell us what will and will not happen. You may not be willing to arrest your way out of the problem, but the drug dealers can't be allowed to sell fentanyl, help them inject it on the sidewalk, 
and then shoot dealers who try to take over their corner. Please bring urgency to your response. We need safety for kids and families. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come out here tonight. And thank you to all the residents who came out tonight to voice their concerns. My name is Pete Smith, and in full transparency, I am the Republican candidate for the 6th District City Council. However, I come to you tonight as a concerned citizen of Philadelphia. In the past two years, I've buried two of my cousins to overdose deaths. I'm also the grandfather of a young boy who stood there while we buried his mother to an overdose death. The reason I stood next to my grandson is because my son, his father, has been somewhere out in Kensington for the last two years addicted to heroin. So as a concerned citizen of this great city of Philadelphia, I come here tonight to ask you, the city administration, why do we allow our children to stay high? I've been asking this question for numerous times over the last few weeks and want to know why the CBH will not allow detox for opioid users. Medically, Medicated assisted treatment programs cannot be successful without proper detoxification so users can clear their body and their mind. Keeping people on methadone and Suboxone does not help. It only pacifies their craving, and once a dose is missed, they fall back into heroin use. Because quite honestly, we make them come back day after day to get medication and whatever reason they forget, they wind up getting that craving back. And since heroin is only $5, it's easy to obtain that. Our city is in the middle of a devastated war against drugs where thousands of our citizens are dying each year, and yet our city does nothing to combat this crisis and does everything to enable it and keep our children high and now we're talking about overdose, overdose protection sites. What's even worse about this, as the state has lowered the regulations and lowered the barriers so that people can seek treatment much easier, users can now obtain treatment without ID, without coverage. There is no 30-day restriction that if you drop out, you have to wait 30 days to come back and there is zero cost. However, in Philadelphia, we push our kids back onto the street. We make their time in rehab when they go there harder by silly regulations of known smoking. In addition, another barrier that was removed for those seeking rehab services is that they no longer need pre-approved authorization from the CBH to enter a rehab. Yet, they remove this barrier, but are not are approving these users for detox, which presents facilities from ethically admitting patients in the rehab without detoxification services. The CBA, CBH allows for detoxification for alcohol and benzo users but not for opiate users. Why? As a citizen, we can no longer tolerate this. Our loved ones need our help. We need to stop putting them on a 30-day carousel with no end in sight. We need a comprehensive plan that will focus on long-term solution that includes harsher penalties for dealers, user intervention, which might include a medical 302 for people who overdose. They need detoxification. They need real rehabilitation and treatment with a focus on mental health and therapy, not only for the users, but for their families, especially the children who are affected by this. 
We then need to help these people re-enter society and the workforce by giving them the tools to be successful. This is a long-term battle that requires your action. Councilwoman Sanchez, you said earlier that City Council has lost the trust of the residents. I'm going to ask you and Councilman Squilla to enact legislation banning the opening of so-called injection sites. Councilman Green, Johnson, O, Tobenberger, and O'Neill, as well as Councilwoman Bass and Parker, have all stated that you are against safe injection sites. That is nine votes. That can be passed in legislation tomorrow. So in the spirit of banning plastic bags, food trucks, bay windows, and hookah lounges, I'm asking you to step up as leaders and stop this debate now on safe injection sites and end it. Otherwise, I will start it in January. Thank you all for your comments, and thanks everybody for coming out and testifying. I mean, it's important to know that uh, safe injection sites are already illegal. You're not allowed to open a safe injection site in the city of Philadelphia. Why can't city council state that? Well, I think it's pretty clear that um, from the um, attorney general, from the uh, United States, U.S. attorney, that it is illegal. I mean, it, you could do a redundancy and have uh, city council do a resolution saying well, it's illegal. And in all due respect, aren't sanctuary cities illegal? Uh, no, they're not illegal. Okay. Well, our mayor, Jim Kenney, before he does an executive order allowing self-injection sites, I think it's only fair that those council persons who are against safe injection sites come up with a resolution so that they're not opened. You guys came up with a resolution to honor Mayor Kenny when he did an executive order on sanctuary cities. Let's not give him the opportunity. You want the trust of the people back, you have to give them what they want. We need to address the opioid crisis in a lot of different ways. We need to stop enabling and we need to start treating and it needs to be a long-term solution. And I, and I think here is, um, you see on council, we agree with you. We agree with you that we need to work together. We do have some differences of opinion as you heard on some of the testimony today, but we still need to work together to end this blight that's on, on the community. And this is an epidemic that we have never seen as a city or a country. So a lot of times people react to something knowing what they did before to do it. We are now learning a process to come up with new ways to try to attack this epidemic in a way that will work, not only for the people who are addicted and hopefully save your son and many others that are out there, but also to help the communities that are inundated with having to put up with a negative impact of them being on the streets of the city of Philadelphia. I mean, I wish we had a magic wand up here and we had a solution and say, you do this and that's the answer. And uh, whether even if it was a safe injection site, if that were for some reason was able to be uh, opened up in the city of Philadelphia, that does not solve this opioid epidemic problem. And arresting everybody who's on the street doesn't solve this opioid problem. So we have to be somewhere in between in, in order to make that work. And I think we are challenged to put certain things in place to make that happen. We've made some strides. We've done some things. I know it's not fast enough or, or good enough. Um, we did have encampments under tunnels and other things that are no longer there, um, which was a major accomplishment through the resilience project. Um, is that enough? No. Do we need to do more? Yes. We could still learn from you and others and other ideas of how to do things to help with this situation. And like uh, the uh, managing director said, if we try something that doesn't work, all right, scrap it, try something else because this is happening in other places, and if we had something that we could model ourselves off of to resolve it, we would do that. But we'll keep trying. I mean, we want your input. We want the community's input. I mean, this is frustrating for everybody, and uh, nobody more than me that wants to get emails from people who are sick and tired of seeing what's going out there, and I have to answer every one of them, 
knowing I'm just as sick and tired of getting them. So uh, we want your input. We want everybody's input here, knowing that we need to do more. And we'll do more, and you've got to hold us accountable. And if we run for election, you vote against us if we're not, if we're not doing what you want. And then you get somebody in there who's going to do what you want. And that's why the election process is here. And so we'll see that in November. We'll see that in next four years, and we'll see in, in the future. And you and I will have a discussion in January. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to ask Brian Abernathy, the managing director's office, to come back. And if we can have someone from the um, uh, Department of Behavioral Health to respond to the two questions about barriers to treatment, particular the de detox issue and the smoking issue. I think all of us know that when we started this conversation, for, the, for some of us, Councilwoman Bass has been hosting these for the last four or five years. The fight was breaking down barriers to access to treatment, and I think we've made a tremendous strides. Um, and I want to just really directly um, have the answers around the de de detoxification, but also the issue of, of the cigarette ban. And I had a conversation with David Jones, you know, the the... The discussion in the community is that we are doing this because we are part of a research that is being conducted about the effectiveness of this new methodology. And so I want a response to if in fact we have gotten tobacco money, research money related to this policy decision. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Niemark. It's N-E-I-M-A-R-K, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Community Behavioral Health. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to uh, speak this evening. I want to um, emphasize that access to treatment is paramount in the eyes of CBH and the department. And to that end, I think we're pleased to report that more individuals have accessed uh, residential treatment in the past 11 months. Uh, than at any time in our history. Um, that's come about because of a number of interventions that we've undertaken. We have removed um, prior authorization. Uh, we have removed requirements around identification. And we have uh, done away with uh, some requirements around things like vital signs and urine drug screen um, mandates. Uh, we also, though, have prioritized that access needs to be to treatment that works and that has an impact. And I'm going to get to the to the questions, but please, please, uh, please permit me to um, go on. There is no CBH policy prohibiting op those with opioid use disorder from accessing detoxification. I will say and go on the record that detoxification alone for opioid use disorder is a poor treatment. People who undergo that virtually are guaranteed to relapse within 12 months. Uh, beyond that, it actually carries an increased mortality risk. So it is not a value-based treatment in terms of clinical outcomes. And in terms of stewardship of financial funds, which we take very seriously, it's not the best. Despite that, it's a state-covered service. We cover it. We approve it. We can furnish numbers on how many folks are accessing it. Um, in terms of the impact, I want to jump into the, to the uh, smoking question. Um, we've spoken a lot tonight about the opioid epidemic. There's also a tobacco epidemic in America. 500,000 Americans die each year because of tobacco. Just for some perspective, that's 10 times the number of those with opioid use disorder. In Philadelphia every year, that's 4,000 people. That's 10 people every single day. It disproportionately kills the poor, minorities, and those with behavioral health conditions who smoke at a rate of three times the general population and lose on average 25 years of life. This epidemic has been going on for decades, but unfortunately we have become immune to it. Tobacco use and its treatment have been neglected in drug and alcohol treatment settings, largely as an outgrowth of tobacco industry support to normalize it. 
Yet there is ample evidence that there are evidence-based treatments that work, that quitting smoking concurrently with uh, addressing another substance use disorder reduces your risk of relapse, and the data shows that most people want to quit. With, with that said, I'd say there's been an undue amount of attention paid to this concept of a ban. This has been a two-year process that we've worked closely with um, folks from New York who helped implement the statewide ban there with uh, folks from the University of Pennsylvania and with Philadelphia Department of Public Health to help educate our provider network, to help change the culture, and to help inform them on treatments that work for nicotine. Smoke-free policies align with what's happening on the physical health side. If you go to any general hospital, they're all tobacco-free. We know that outcomes are positive. So if you look at the data from New York, and even if you look at New Jersey, where they stopped this, there were no problems with access of treatment or AMAs. This smoke-free policy aligns with what we do with other substances. For instance, there's no rum that is prescribed on an inpatient unit. It's not allowed, but we don't talk about an alcohol ban. Uh, this policy has the chance to impact the largest substance abuse killer of people in Philadelphia. We've been asked about the timing of this around why now. I would take the position that there is never a bad time to prioritize this. It, the substance... Folks, folks, folks. So can you answer the question about are we conducting a research and that we get funding to do it at this time? I just want to answer it publicly so we address this stuff, DBH right? DBH is not conducting re CBH is not conducting research on the health department, the, the city. Unit. Anybody in the city receiving tap tobacco money for the implementation, is this process going to be researched? The only researched possibly, the only amount of um, funding that I'm aware of is that a grant for approximately $50,000 was received from CVS around smoking initiatives two years ago. Okay. So this I, is going to... I, I just want to respond to all of these allegations about... Yeah. There's a study. Uh, we need a more direct response, so I want something in writing. If we got tobacco sure. money to implement this policy, if there's going to be a study conducted around this. We need transparency. Absolutely. We can furnish that. Okay. Councilman Dom had a question for, for Brian, and then we're going to let people make closing statements. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for coming out. And this is not really a, more of a statement, Brian, than a question, and for two more also. And you probably know what I'm going to say. But um, I've been listening to all these issues. I've traveled through this area several times. I was actually through here Monday night where uh, someone came right in front of my car and I almost hit the person. It was so bad. And that person was out of it. So I'm listening to everything and I'm saying to myself, we're going to be here in two years, and it's not going to be that much different. And we need to do something that's drastically different. And as Councilman Squill said, if it doesn't work, try something else. But we need to do something drastically different than what we've done. So I've said this in council. I'm hearing everything. I'm looking at the maps that we have provided. And I'm saying to myself, we as a city should fund, pay for, a special services district in this neighborhood that does cleaning, that does more community service, that provides security, that does all those services that they deserve. And if it costs us 50 people, I did the math real quickly, 50 people per shift, three shifts a day, seven days a week, it's about seven and a half million dollars. Might sound like a lot of money, but in the scope of our budget, it's not. I'm just saying, can we at least look at this as one of the solutions, it's not the total solution, but it would be a big way, like if I, if I walk out of my row home in this neighborhood and I saw needles on the ground, I'd be flipping out. At least if we had a cleaner, safer neighborhood, we could maybe then deal with the bigger issues. And oh, by the way, we could hire from, is it ready, willing, and able, people that are on drugs who have now gone off drugs and gone into the workforce. We could hire 150, 200 people, even in the neighborhood, to do this kind of work. So just something I think we should look at and, and, and maybe come back to us. And if it's the money issue, I will, I can't speak for everybody, I would approve it because it's worth it. Um, 
so thank you, Councilman. Um, we are actually doing some of that work now. We have pay, we are paying people to pick up needles. Um, those people are ex, um, at times current users and ex users. We're working very closely with Impact Services, and we're looking at expanding those programs as well. We wanted to test to see if they're working. They are working, um, and we're happy to expand. And, and I think part of the sustainability strategy, we are, uh, you know, a business improvement district may be part of that as well. Is it possible for you to come back to us with a written proposal to provide a special services district for the area that's been affected? I think we can come back with a, a plan on sustainability. I don't want to commit tonight to a special services district, um, but I understand the concept very well. I've worked with them uh, uh, all over the city, um, and I, I think uh, I wouldn't want to create a new organization when a current organization could do the same same services. So uh, I think that's an ongoing conversation. Right. I just want to add that um, you know we with the new money that we got for commercial carters, I think there's a commitment here. I agree with Brian. I think if if anything we've learned in this process is we have engaged stakeholders, impact us in New Kensington CDC. You know we have a commercial cleaning co um, contract that that we give them the same, even though we recognize that there's so much work to be done. We've been pushing SEPTA to help us with the cleaning. They moved 30,000 of their customers to Kensington and Allegheny, and they need to, do, to, to be more active. So we have folks on the ground that we've asked to do a whole lot with a little, that we need to come back and, and provide them with more resources to do the more sustainable work moving forward. You know, I've, I've been really adamant with the administration about that. I, I, you know, let's not come in. Um, and I've assisted. We've asked community to be volunteers. We've asked parents to be volunteers. We need to pay some of these folks because it's like you ask the poorest people to be the volunteers. Everybody here is getting paid. All of us are getting paid except the people on the ground. And I think Again, we had this meeting with Councilman Squilla and I, with Brian and folks. We need to assure people, and we need to do this rather quickly, that we're going to be disruptive in the behavior, that we're going to improve quality of life, and that we're going to respect them in the process. And we have the next 30 days to really demonstrate that through our actions and our resources. Um, that we put in here. So, uh, Brian, I'll let you do closing remarks and any of my colleagues who want to do closing remarks, really thank all of you for coming out um, this evening. Yeah, I, I just, I, again, I want to thank you and I want to thank the community behind me. I understand their frustration. Um, I don't live here every day. Um, that's not fair. Uh, these are issues that I care deeply about, um, that we're going to continue to invest in, um, that you're going to continue to see my face, whether you frankly, whether you want to or not. Um, I, I want to resolve these issues. Um, I want these, these streets to be safe to walk down. I want our kids to feel safe going to school. Uh, I want Kensington, to be a, a Kensington Ave to be a flourishing business corridor. I want the vacant houses to be uh, not boarded up, to be lived in um, through an affordable housing program. Um, that's our commitment. Uh, that's been the commitment of this administration, not just in Kensington, but in some of our hardest hit communities that, frankly, we have ignored for far too long. Um, that's what we're going to do. Um, and I will be here uh, as long as, as you all let me be here. Uh, but this hasn't been acceptable, in short. Um, and I, I don't think I've ever said, ah, oh, we're doing just fine, because we're not. Uh, and we're going to continue to work. We're going to continue to do things differently. And I know it's never going to be fast enough. Um, but I, I expect uh, to be in this forum uh, for quite some time. Uh, I think Tumar expects the same thing. Uh, and all of our staff expects the same thing. Um, they know that this is not just a commitment of me or just uh, of my deputies or of a commissioner. This is a commitment of the mayor. Uh, and, uh, and we're here. Well, thank, thank you, Brian, and Tumar, and uh, Joanna, and the whole team of folks that come out here. I mean, again, you're right, it's not enough. There's more to do. But when we started this, um, it was, I was cautiously optimistic that there would be some benefits. And I've actually seen some benefits in, and it's, um, some things have changed in a positive light, even though we have a long way to go, and there's still an increase in 
in, in drug activity out there and users activity and the neighbors are still putting up with the same type of things that they were putting up with before. But I think as a whole, we still have to work together as a team, whether it's the police, the district attorney, manager, director's office, council, residents, and we have to make sure that we get on the same page. The other thing is we have to have policies in place that everybody understands. The community understands what they are, the police understands what they are, council understands what they are. And you know where I'm going with this because we've been trying to get a, a, a homeless tenting policy for a long period of time. And that needs to be put in place hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, something that everybody knows exactly what the rules and laws are so that we could hold each other accountable. And then if we're not doing it, we know exactly who's not doing it. Right now, it's easy for us to point fingers at everybody else because we're not all on the same page yet. Hopefully in over the summer, by the time this fall comes, we all get there and, and are doing the same thing and therefore the finger pointing stops. But the uh, Resilience and the positive outcomes are starting to be more and more noticed. Not that they're not noticed now, because they are, but there's still that inkling and frustration that you hear from the community that we hear and we know, and you know we beat you guys up over it too, day in and day out, uh, because we get tired of hearing of it also. And um, there has been, you know, times where we're going to disagree on things, and, you know, that'll be public and we'll know we go in different directions. Uh, but I do appreciate these meetings because these meetings give us the time for people to hear some of the other things that they may not know what's going on. But also it gives us a chance to hear still the frustration that's out there in the communities and what they're living with day in and day out. And so the, thank you for your time and efforts. Appreciate it. Well, I want to I want to join my colleagues in thanking everyone for being here this evening for this very important discussion. Um, I want to particularly thank um, the community because the rest of us, who primarily are public servants, we serve the community. That's what we are paid to do, and so it's important that we step up in a major way and hear you when you speak about your concerns. Because for so many people in this city, we have so many folks who are living either in poverty or, or close to the poverty line or who are you know, just barely hanging on to be a middle class and folks who are really struggling no matter where they are. And for all of those folks, they desperately need government to work for them. And when it does not work, the effects can be devastating. And so uh, I just want you to know that we hear you. I believe that we all hear you. And I wanna thank you for coming out, for sharing your input. And uh, we're going to continue to work. We're going to continue to have these conversations, these hearings. I want to thank my colleagues, especially uh, Councilwoman Maria Quinones Sanchez, for just being so dogged on this issue and for really making sure that it's at the forefront of what we talk about in terms of addressing issues within the city of Philadelphia. So, again, thanks to everyone who, who showed up tonight, and thank you, Councilwoman. I just want to echo the statements made by our chair, Councilmember uh, Cindy Bass, as well as the work that Councilmember uh, Maria Quino Sanchez has made, as well as Councilmember Mark Squilla. Um, this has been an issue that they have been working on for a long time, and I think a number of people feel the frustration. And, I, and I, the, the question I have, and this may be a question I can ask for uh, the administration, is um, the next step to make sure that although we have this frustration, that going forward we're making incremental progress. So that way, as Marnie and others have said, when we come back 45 days, 90 days, a year from now, we're not seeing the same issues. I think there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of good work. It's like pushing a boulder up a hill, but we've got to make some progress. So my question to the administration is, where do you see his next steps? Uh, the councilwoman asked for something in writing, and in the next, certainly by the end of July, um, we'll have something in writing to council um, that we'll certainly share with the community as well um, around uh, sustainability um, volunteers um, and because you're right we can't we can't ask these people to continue to volunteer um, and around public safety thank you very much with the, with those remarks we are um, concluding our hearing this public hearing uh, from the uh, committee on uh, public health and human services and uh, we will hold this meeting in recess until the call of the chair thank you so much for everyone to everyone for attending